This conference will now be recorded. Okay. Thank you. So today is Wednesday, March 23rd, 2022, and I'd like to call this evening's City Council meeting to order. If we could all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk, could I have the roll call? Council Member Fox? Present. Council Member Casper? Is that me? <laughs> I'm here. Council Member Boyle? Present. Council Member Strobin? Here. Council Member Servany? Present. Mayor Thornton. Present. Thank you. Next is the consent agenda. If there are no requests for any items to be removed, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. And second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Clerk, could I have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Fox? Yes. Council Member Kasberg? Yes. Council Member Boyle? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Council Member Strobin? Yes. Council Member Servany? Yes. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Next are presentations and proclamations. I do have a proclamation I'd like to read to the council this evening. Uh, this evening's proclamation is National Communicators Week, April 10th through this April 16th, 2022. Whereas the Clark Regional Emergency Services Agency, CRESA, 911 Communication Center is the initial point of contact for individuals in crisis with the Life and Property Saving Emergency Response Network, and whereas trained professional 911 dispatchers work as a team evaluating information and initiating the correct response of personnel and equipment resources commensurate with the location and nature of the emergency. And whereas high degrees of communication skills are employed to save lives by giving emergency instructions, including first aid and pre-arrival information to those in crisis while help in, is in response, and whereas a team effort is provided to field response paramedics, firefighters, and law enforcement officers in monitoring, channeling, and directing vital communications during emergency operations, and whereas skilled 911 dispatchers function as a logistical resource data bank to provide appropriate support personnel and equipment resources as may be requested by the on-scene emergency responders at any incident in a timely manner. Now, therefore, I, Greg Thornton, Mayor of La Center, do hereby proclaim April 10th through April 16th, 2022, as the National Telecommunicators Week and encourage all citizens to join in this observance. Council, can I get a motion to approve the proclamation? Moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the proclamation. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Opposed. Motion carries. Thank you.
Next, I have a letter of resignation from uh, Police Officer Sheridan Crutcher, along with the plaque that he will be presented with. I'll first read his letter of resignation, and then we'll I'll read the plaque. Um, the re letter of resignation is dated 3-3-22. It's to Chief Bob Richardson. Please accept this as my formal resignation from the City of La Center Police Department. My last day will be 3-17-2022. I am grateful for all the support during my time here and deeply pre appreciate all the valuable experience I have gained. It has been a sincere pleasure working for the police department and the city of La Center. Please let me know how I can help during the transition and make it as smooth as possible. I wish the police department and the city of La Center the very best. Thanks for everything. Signed, Sheridan Crutcher. In front of you, we have a photo of the plaque that he will be presented. It's going to be presented to Sheridan Crutcher, police officer, in recognition and appreciation of your service and dedication to the citizens of La Center. His years of service in La Center were 2008, for 2018 through 2022. So I just want to wish Officer Crutcher the very best with all his future endeavors and hope, wish him the very best as he seeks new career opportunities in the state of Montana. Next on the agenda is citizens public comment. Clerk, do we have any public comments for this evening? Yes, Mayor, we have three. Would you please read them? First comment is from Nelda Perryman, 824 East Pioneer Loop. Mayor Thornton, after reading Clark County Sheriff Chuck Atkins comments in the Columbia newspaper about rising crime and decreasing staff, I am very concerned. Sheriff Atkins says due to severe staffing shortages in all branches of the agency, his department will no longer respond to certain calls for service by the end of this month. Since you, Mayor Thornton and Chief Richardson have indicated that the contract you wanted with Clark County Sheriff has been rejected and you think discussions with Woodland PD or the Cowlitz tribe would not be a viable option, even on a short term basis, what exactly is your plan to provide police coverage for the tax paying residents in La Center? When will we be advised as to how you are planning to fix this problem that the citizens of La Center think should never have occurred in the first place? I'm hoping as mayor, you are aware that this policing issue in La Center is the number one issue voters are concerned about. Yet nothing has changed from the current trajectory that began over a year ago. I and many others are looking forward to hearing what the solution will be. Sincerely, Nelda Perryman. Second public comment, Dennis Hill, 1316 West Alder Place. Greetings, Mayor, City Council, and La Center citizens. Mm -hmm. I have not heard from Chief Richardson lately on any progress in working out the details with the Clark County Sheriff for police protection for our city. I want to continue to encourage the Mayor and City Council to work towards putting in place reliable, sustainable, and affordable police protection for our city. We are fortunate to have Chief Bob Richardson at the helm with his knowledge and personal contacts with the neighboring cities. I know he is working hard daily trying to obtain patrol officers assistance to cover our three patrol shifts and come up with a more permanent solution to our policing need. Thank you, Chief. I want to continue to encourage the mayor and city council to seek solutions that will allow us to have open in-person city council meetings. I believe the citizens of the center truly want this. Please make this a high priority item on your agenda for 2022. I have not seen anything from the city regarding soliciting developers and builders to look at the various properties at the La Center Junction. I know the city does not own any property at the junction, but I also believe this will be where La Center has the biggest opportunity to generate new revenue for the city. I believe we need to publicize La Center as the best city in North Clark County to build your business. Thank you. Respectfully submitted, Dennis Hill. Third public comment, Judy Hill, 1316 West Alder Place. Greetings, Mayor, City Council, and La Center citizens. I want to share my disappointment with a few of the current council members. Council meeting after council meetings, 
these few don't show, choose to show their faces to the public. It doesn't give me a warm, fuzzy feeling that they are very transparent. Council members, you know who you are. It makes me feel that you don't want to, that you don't want the public to know who you are. As a council member, I would think that you want the citizens to recognize you so that you are approachable with concerns. I held my opinion for a long time, but think it needs to be pointed out. This, however, won't be the issue once open in-person council meetings take place, but for the time virtual continues, hopefully you will change your hidden faces. Body language speaks volumes. Thank you. Respectfully submitted, Judy Hill. That is the end of the public comments. Thank you, Kurt. Um, I would like to just have a, make a few comments here to uh, Nelda Perryman's public comment. Um, first of all, in her statement where she says that um, Clark County Sheriff, um, well, let me read the, the whole sentence here. Since you, Mayor Thornton and Chief Richardson have indicated that the contract you wanted with Clark County Sheriff has been rejected, and you think the discussions with Woodland PD and College Tribe would not be a viable option, even in the short term. Um, I don't know where Ms. Perryman is getting her information, but none of those three statements are factually correct. Um, Clark County Sheriff Department has not rejected the proposal for Le Center, and communications are still going on with both the City of Woodland and with the College Tribe. So that's not correct. Um, she also asked, what is the plan to provide police coverage in the short term for the taxpaying residents of the center? Well, we will continue to do what we've been doing for the past year, and that's to utilize the officers that we have on staff here in the center to fill as many shifts as that they're able to fill. Then we will resort to paying overtime to officers from other jurisdictions to fill shifts that we can't fill with our own police officers. In the event that we can't fill shifts, we will continue to rely on mutual aid. It's not the best of scenarios, but that is what the city of La Center has been doing for the past year, and that's what we'll continue doing in the short term. I want to assure everybody that I'm well aware of the situation with the La Center Police Department. It is the highest of priorities for the city, and I will continue to work with the city council to find a long-term viable solution for providing police services to the city of the center. And I want to thank Chief Richardson for his continued support and hard work in that regard. Um, Chief, do you have anything to add to the, my comments? Um, I hate to add a little fuel to the fire, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments. Uh, uh, just so you know, uh, I recognize that uh, uh, it is a very, the number one priority in the city is public safety and that we're doing everything we can to provide uh, those services. I do think that uh, those comments uh, do misrepresent what I've said in the past. I've always said that PCSO would be the best alternative to contract out the police department uh, just because they're on the same uh, same court system, same record system, same radio system, and it, it made sense. Obviously, when we started a year ago, uh, they weren't in the position that they are today. So although CCSO, in my opinion, is not the most readily, uh, readily available uh, agency to go to right now, I think long-term they will be. You start talking about three to five years from now. Remember that the first agency we approached was not Clark County Sheriff, it was actually the city of Ridgefield. In the city of Ridgefield, uh, the, the police chief was actually interested in providing contract services, but ultimately the city administration decided they weren't interested in doing that. So that left us with going back uh, to the C CCSO in the spring of 2021. And in the spring of 2021, the Sheriff's Department was on board and we started meeting. However, people have to understand that working with the Clark County government, and I'm sure Casey's had this experience, it's very long and cumbersome compared to uh, working within the city of uh, La Center. It takes a long time to no. get through a process, especially a process that uh, involves the County Council. You just can't uh, get on their agenda tomorrow. It's uh, one of those things and then summertime we worked all through this and at the end i'm of the on day, 
Yes, we um, <coughs> believe that there's good news for us today, Lord. At the at the end of the day, um, let's remember that we were one council meeting away from actually having a contract in November 2021, and then at the last minute, the sheriff's department uh, notified us that we could not. Uh, they cannot provide the services, and I understand the situation they're in. Uh, you can't uh, recruit police officers if you're not paying enough money, and even if you're paying enough money, uh, it takes a long time because of the hiring pool, the number of people you can process is not out there any longer. So um, I think the uh, I think the county sheriff is a viable alternative three to five years from now. Obviously, uh, not now. And then let's talk about uh, Woodland and the Calus tribe. Nobody ever said that either Woodland PD or the Cows tribes were not options. What I did say is the Woodland Police Department provides uh, some operational issues because they have to operate in two different counties uh, with two different dispatch centers, uh, two different record systems, two different court systems, two different prosecutor systems. So that's that one thing. And the other thing uh, is the college tribe, I've actually, uh, theirs is not so much an operational issue, it's more of a liability and contractual issue. So I did meet with John Pound again last week, March 15th, and we have reached out to our insurance pool and our attorneys in the insurance pool. We're waiting for them to come back um, with the pros and cons of what it, uh, what it would be for the city as far as liability and their sovereign immunity uh, to sign a contract with the Cowlitz tribe. We remember that uh, Unlike, uh, let's say, Woodland PD, if we have a Cowlitz police officer that's working within the city limits of a center, and we have an agreement that says that this the uh, Cowlitz tribe is going to cover their liability, and something happens, we're going to get sued, and so is the tribe, and the tribe is very difficult to sue because they're a sovereign nation. So we need to get our insurance carrier to give us the input on the pros and cons, so the council has the ability to then make a decision along with the mayor. Uh, is it worth the liability to contract with the, the tribe? That's something we have to find out. And then at the short term, like the mayor stated before, we have our two officers that are currently working. And when they're uh, available, they work, and they also get first right to overtime. If they don't want to work the overtime, we can't uh, order them to work by contract. So that's when we go out and we... Uh, hire officers on an overtime basis uh, from primarily Wood, uh, Washougal, Clark County Sheriffs in Ridgefield. And they've been good partners. And a lot of the times we've had uh, them fill shifts and it's worked out fine for a year with no serious issues. But then there are times that we actually have nobody working and that's when we have to rely on mutual aid. And I understand that uh, this is an important topic for everybody here that's listening tonight. But I think what people need to understand too is the long-term issue with the city of La Center is we lost $2 million worth of revenue. And that $2 million worth of revenue for a city of the size of La Center is a great impact on the budget. And over the years, we've been drawing down our reserves in order to pay and balance our general fund. And I think uh, in the future, especially in the near future, you're gonna see labor costs go up between five and 8%. You're going to see additional policing mandates from the state of Washington that cost uh, money, and we're going to have other operational costs that are going to go up. And I still truly believe that a fully funded police department would take about $2.1 million to ramp up when you look at buying additional equipment and hiring officers and providing officers with a hiring bonus or at the other end, maybe a retention bonus. We also have... Uh, I also think that uh, the police department after that's going to run you between about 1.8 and $2 million. I think that's a reasonable estimate in today's economy. And we also have the issues with very generous labor agreements, which allow for officers to have abundant amount of time off. And we have no minimum staffing levels, which is something we would have to actually bargain with the, the union. And we also have uh, the issue that uh, we have no money uh, in the future to fund a police building. So those are things that the council has to, to look at, and they're the ones that ultimately have to solve this issue. Uh, to put this in perspective, if you wanted to generate $2 million worth of revenue in the city of the center today, and you went out and you had the ability to tax every resident in the city, it would cost you about 1500 I'm sorry, about 
$111 a month per resident. And that would generate the $2 million if you had about 1,500 housing units. And then you'd have to think about the 3%, roughly 3% increase it would cost you every year on top of that. That's not something that council has uh, an easy ability to do. So I want to want to uh, recognize that. I think the best course for, the, for this city is that the people have to recognize, and so is the council, the council has to have some consensus that we have a revenue issue in their city. And the first thing we need to do is get some consensus on that key principle. And once we have consensus on that key principle, that, hey, how do we generate revenue for the city? Then we could start going out and talking about, okay, how can we afford our own police department or contracting out? And then as we move to that decision, we have a short-term solution is what we've been doing for the last year. And then the long-term solution is either a contract with another agency, which we're continuing to work on, or ramping up a police department. But I'm telling you that you can't do any of that until you've identified long-term consistent revenue. And some of this one-time revenue the city's seen over the last couple of years, whether it's sales tax, because we built a big project like a school, which doesn't come around except about every 20 years or so, or some kind of relief money from the federal government, you can't rely on that. Uh, that would be like you getting a IRS refund one year, so you go out and buy a bigger house with a big, bigger mortgage, because you had a one-time influx of some, some money. So I think with that being said, I would like to see, it would be really nice for, uh, I, I think all of us, including our surrounding cities, to ultimately get some consensus of what direction we want to go. And so with that being said, and I understand Nelda's comments and everybody else's comments, I appreciate them. But I think what people are missing is the point that we had no control over uh, losing $2 million worth of revenue. So that's where we are. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate your explanation. Um, okay, next is the mayor's report. Uh, I just have a couple items this evening that I'd like to uh, share with the council. Uh, one of these will address uh, Mr. Hill's uh, public comment as well. And I know we're all anxious to resume our open public meetings, having our city council meetings in person. Uh, I'm especially excited for getting that started. Uh, the city is diligently working to put together our technology in order to make that happen. Again, remember, we'll have to have both a virtual meeting and a in-person meeting conducted simultaneously. And we would have to be able to accommodate all different forms of people trying to um, be on the meeting virtually or if they want to call in by telephone or whatever the method of communication that they want to use. So uh, the city is getting close to having that done. Uh, we hope to have it done here in the next uh, week or so. Uh, I know that might be a little bit of ambitious. Um, Maria kind of went out on a limb there, but um, we're anxious to get that done. And as soon as we can start conducting meetings and meeting the state mandates, um, as soon as we can start conducting in-person meetings and meeting the state mandates, we're definitely going to make that happen. Um, and the other thing I want to mention this evening is that my next mayor's town hall will be Wednesday, April 6th, beginning at 6 p.m. And that will be an in-person meeting. And I'll be having that meeting at the Le Center Community Center. So again, my next town hall will be Wednesday, April 6th, beginning at 6 p.m. And it will be at the Le Center Community Center. It's open to anyone that would like to join us. It's an informal meeting. It's an opportunity for people to bring their thoughts and ideas, concerns, questions, or what have you to a meeting that it's, uh, again, open to the public. And we pretty much just have a conversation or discussion. And I try to address as many issues as people, as many issues as I can in the evening that people have the questions. So that's all I have to share with the council this evening. Next on the agenda is the attorney's report. City attorney, do you have anything to share with the council this evening? I do, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody, and happy spring 2022. Um, I have a couple items. One is uh, 
addressing the governor's most recent proclamation on masking requirements. And second is the uh, legislature's passage of Ingros Substitute House Bill 1329, which amends certain provisions of the Open Public Meetings Act. So starting with the governor's proclamation, and that's Proclamation 2025.19, which he uh, issued on March 21st, uh, changing the masking requirements for the state of Washington. I think at our last council meeting, I may have addressed some of these requirements or the changes, but I'll take this opportunity to review these. Um, so as you no doubt know that effective March 12 this year, uh, the governor rescinded the prior masking requirements and replaced them with the requirements in Proclamation 2025.19. Uh, and so that did away with requiring uh, the public to wear masks uh, in situations other than healthcare facilities, long-term care facilities, and correctional facilities. Uh, the proclamation requires that employers uh, keep uh, workers who are known or suspected to be infected uh, with COVID from working around others. Employers have to provide hand washing stations and regularly clean uh, sanitize surfaces. Uh, employers have to educate workers on the COVID prevention. Uh, employers have to provide written notice within one day to all workers who are in the same work site as someone who is tested positive for COVID. And employers have to allow employees to wear masks if they choose to do so. Uh, requiring proof of vaccine status has been uh, done away with, except for schools and healthcare facilities, and uh, there are no longer distancing requirements in the workplace. Um, the uh, Local jurisdictions and businesses still have the option of choosing to require, require masking if they wish to do so. So the governor's proclamation is sort of a floor or minimum level of protection, but local health jurisdictions and businesses can require uh, additional protection if they, if they choose to do so. And employees have the right to wear masks if they want to, uh, and employers cannot prohibit them from doing so. Uh, so that's a pretty uh, high level review of the proclamation, but I think it covers the things that have impact to the city. Uh, if there's any questions on that masking proclamation, I'd be happy to try and answer them. <coughs> Okay, the second item that I'm going to address is the ingress to the House Bill 1329. Uh, so this was uh, passed by the legislature on March 3rd, and it was sent to the governor for signature on March 11. Uh, the governor has not signed it yet. Uh, when he signs it, the bill will become effective immediately. But this uh, piece of legislation uh, changes the Open Public Meetings Act, uh, and it does so in the following manner. Um, public agencies are encouraged uh, to provide for increased public access and participation through remote means, be it telephone, internet, or other uh, means of remote access. Uh, they're encouraged to make an audio or video recording of their meetings and to make those uh, recordings available online for at least six months. So with respect to the city of La Center, I mean, I think we're doing all those things uh, today under our current practices. Another change is that uh, when we go into executive session, uh, the purpose of the executive session has to be entered into the minutes of the meeting. And again, I, I'm, sure that we're doing that today under our current practices. Uh, agencies have to provide 
uh, an opportunity for public comment at every regular meeting where final action is taken. That public comment can be by way of oral comments during the meeting or providing an opportunity to submit written comments prior to the meeting and the city could set a reasonable deadline for submitting written comments. So um, this does not require uh, the ability to provide remote comment at every regular meeting where final action is taken. And for us, um, regular meetings where final action are taken uh, includes our regular meetings, but would not include our workshops. So again, I think this is a, uh, a practice that we're currently engaged in. I, citizens always have the opportunity to submit comments at our regular meetings. Um, a new requirement is that uh, cities and, and other local agencies have to provide, to the extent feasible, they have to provide the ability for somebody to provide remote public comment if they are disabled or physically limited in their ability to attend a meeting. Uh, so that's a new requirement. Um, we've been doing remote meetings for quite a while now, uh, but we've been doing that under the governor's proclamation of an emergency and the governor's proclamations modifying the Open Public Meetings Act. Uh, so under the Open Public Meetings Act, before these proclamations, uh, we could not meet entirely remotely. There would have to be some physical location that people could go to uh, to hear and observe a public meeting, even though some council members could participate remotely, but there still had to be a physical location requirement. Now under this legislation, uh, there is the ability to remote, uh, excuse me, to meet entirely remotely if the local jurisdiction declares an emergency. So that's a change. Uh, we don't have to rely on the governor's proclamation anymore. A local agency can, or the state could declare an emergency and allow a remote meeting. But even when you do that under a uh, local or state declaration of emergency, you have to provide the option of the public to at least listen to the meeting. Um, additionally, the legislation uh, allows local governing bodies to uh, impose conditions on attending a meeting to the extent that that's necessary to protect public healthy, health and safety. Uh, so before this legislation, you could not impose conditions on people uh, just for the purpose of attending a meeting. Um, this legislation changed that. It gives you the ability to impose conditions that are necessary for public health. Uh, the, the last item that I would say that could affect us is with respect to uh, providing notice of special meetings. And uh, now the requirement is that a notice of special meetings has to be posted on the agency's website if it's going to be held remotely or with limited in-person attendance. Um, this bill passed with uh, overwhelming support, uh, both in the House and in the Senate, uh, and it's, I'm sure the governor will be signing it shortly. And like I said, it will become effective immediately upon signature. So Mayor, uh, that concludes my remarks. I, Anybody has any questions? I'll try to look at okay, very good. Thank you, Bronson. <clears throat> Next on the agenda are council comments. Uh, council Member Fox, any comments for the group this evening? Uh, hi, Mayor. Hi, everyone. Uh, tonight, I do not have any comments. Um, I'm excited for uh, in-person meetings and to conduct that and to show up uh, ready to go. Thank you. Thank you. 
Councilmember Casper. Yeah, I have a couple things that I would like to bring up. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first of all, we're right at the end of the of the first quarter, and I'd kind of hoped that we would have a little bit more movement, but um, I know that city business is slow, but I don't think it has to be this slow. So I would I would like to see some more movement when it comes to dealing with the probably the number one and the number two issue in the city. Um, I appreciate Chief Richardson's comments. I think he's spot on 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 many of them. Um, one thing that stood out was he mentioned that there needs to be a, a consensus. And I think the issue with that is that there has to be some sort of proposal or viable options um, before we're able to to reach a consensus of anything. And I know that funding is an issue, and I think that it looks like a little bit later on in the meeting there may be some issues that we can take action on to start improving that. But um, I, I think we need to get together and start addressing that in a in a meaningful way. Um, you know, with as many new counselors as we have, it's going to take a little bit of time to uh, kind of figure out what our role is and what the rules are. And so I think we're getting there. Um, but I think we've just scratched the surface and there's a lot more that, that needs to be done. So I look forward to doing that. Um, as the chief mentioned earlier, um, public safety is a big issue and it's a concern of most of the citizens, I'm sure and it needs to be addressed. Um, he's exactly right. CCSO is losing staff at a, at a pretty alarming rate, which means that uh, the ability to respond for mutual aid is going to diminish. Um, I think filling shifts with overtime is a, is a, it's a good, very short term fix, but I think we're at the end of, of that. So um, I'm hoping that we can get some direction, we can set up work sessions, whatever it is that we need to do to determine if there's a funding um, issue that we can fix, um, but figure out how it's available to either obtain a contract with an outside agency or, or just start rebuilding. Um, I think we live in a safe area right now, but things are not getting better across the rest of the county. So we're fortunate in that regard, um, but I'm, I think we're ready to start making some, some decisions and get some, some movement going here. Um, the only other thing I have is baseball season is starting and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, opening ceremonies. And there'll be some games on Saturday at Holly Park. So if anybody's interested, come on and cheer the kids on. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councilmember Casper. So you're suggesting we need to have, I think what I'm hearing is you're suggesting that we need to have more work sessions and more meetings. We wanna see more uh, movement. Um, we went through this um, process here a couple of weeks ago where we had a meeting scheduled, uh, actually a retreat for a Saturday. Um, you know, I queried the council twice, two separate city council meetings for dates. Um, then three council members, um, after I got confirmations, decided that they weren't gonna be available for that Saturday uh, work session. It's challenging for some of the council members to meet during the week um, prior to 6.30. What are you suggesting that we do for additional work sessions or what have you? Well, I was one of the ones that, that canceled, and the reason was because my uncle passed away and there was a, a memorial scheduled for that day, so I wasn't going to be able to attend. Also, there was a, three of us on the council have kids in, in baseball, and so the original opening ceremonies were going to be that week, so that was another other reason. Um, you know, I, it's not ideal to cancel, but sometimes that was, those kind of things happen. Um, I think all day um, work sessions are great if we can if we can make it happen. But I worked for a man one time that said that 
there's only one way to eat an elephant and that's one bite at a time so rather than scheduling an entire day to deal with a lot of things let's let's pick one topic and schedule a meeting for that and and attack it head on whether that be um some of the funding things which i know is going to be more longer term but i know chief richardson has some ideas on what we can do um to make some progress on the public safety issues and uh, i think that's something that the majority of the council hasn't had the opportunity is to to hear him speak about some of his ideas um you know we don't we only get a little bite of what it is that he's doing when we're in these meetings and i have kind of an advantage because i understand what a lot of that stuff is that goes on behind the scenes but um i think if the if the rest of the council hears some of those things we can we can come to that consensus a little bit sooner does that make sense sir it does so okay so you're not in favor of having an all-day uh, city council retreat um are saturdays an option for the council to have even a three or four hour some of these things are all options um you know we can pull over an email and figure out when that when that works but um again my main point wasn't to discount the, the necessity for some all-day sessions here and there it was let's let's pick an issue and attack it and come come up with some viable options and make a decision on it okay so let's do this council if you could please look at your calendars look when you'd be available to have meetings uh at the next city council meeting we will uh, have this discussion again again i'm uh i I agree with uh, Council Member Casper that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, I do think we need to schedule more meetings, but it's really going to be up to the um, City Council to be available for those meetings and to dedicate the time and the, um, you know, adjust your calendars, calendars accordingly. So um, again, if everyone could just take a look at their calendars at the next meeting, we'll query everyone. I'm a little reluctant to do this via email. Uh, so I think I'd rather just do it when we're all in a meeting, set the date and get everybody's confirmation at that time. Okay. So I appreciate your comments, council member Casper. Did you have anything else this evening for the group? No, okay. thank you. Thank you. Council member Boyle. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks to all those guests that showed up tonight. Um, I don't have a whole lot. I don't know if this is the appropriate time to ask, but I did uh, have something brought to my attention from a resident saying that they were told that there was going to be some sort of new fee structure for permits for local events. And I was just wondering if we're going to be talking about that tonight or if you have any knowledge about that. Um, yes. we. This evening, we are going to go over some of the fees. I'm not sure which ones you're talking about particularly, but uh, we that's part of the discussion or part of the presentation that uh, Mr. Snell will be presenting here later this evening. I think these uh, specifically pertain to the Easter egg hunt and our days and things of that like, so. Okay. Um... I don't know that that's all in this fee schedule, but we will surely uh, get you an answer on that. Uh, so you, your question is, these are new fees? Yes, I was. Uh, somebody was asking me about some new permit fees that we we're going to be imposing on um, for events, like as a permit, and then also talking about the vendors, like out at the bridge as well. I was. I've been getting questions about that and how we're planning to address some of the public concerns with what, how that business is being handled out there amongst all the vendors that do set up out at the bridge. Right. Yeah. I can tell you as far as the vendors at the bridge, that is something that the city staff is tackling at this time. Uh, pretty much everyone is engaged with that right now. Uh, there'll be more forthcoming on that here in the very near future. Um, I'm not aware of any new fees. I think that the city's permitting fees that we're charging for these different events have always been in place. 
city staff, is there anyone that can correct me on that? Are there been any new fees for the events that are taking place in the center? I can speak to that, Mayor. Thank you. So we have always had a special event permit fee, but it was actually never documented. And so uh, that is why it's not being charged to the lion for the, the upcoming event. But in the new fee structure, the special event per permit fee is actually in there. Now they don't, they do get the facility for free because they're nonprofit, but the special events permit is something that's, that's separate from the use of the facility. I also want to add in that during the Christmas celebration, the owner of 4th Street Tavern commented to me that he was frustrated that you guys asked them to participate by being open and then you charge them a fee for that. And he was frustrated with that. So because we're on the topic, I'm bringing it up because he said the year prior, there was no $50 fee. And he was just feeling frustrated because you asked him to be open and it wasn't a day he's ever open, but he did it to support the city. And then you charged him a, a fee, which as a small business owner, it would frustrate me as well when they're just coming back from COVID and trying to get under their feet. But so is the city. So I understand, but I don't think it was communicated properly is all. Okay. Well, again, those fees have always been in place. So. Um, we can address that in another city council staff report here in the near future council. Okay. Uh, any other um, comments this evening, council member Boyle? Nope, that should do it. Thank you. Thank you. Council member Strobin. Any comments this evening, Council Member Strobin? Can you not hear me? I hear you now. Ah, perfect. No, I think uh, Casey, uh, Councillor uh, Casper, actually stated some of the stuff that I wanted to bring up, uh, and he did a good job at that. Uh, I just want to remind people uh, as well that the uh, baseball season is opening, just like Casey had stated, and we really look forward to people coming out and cheering on the, the kids. It's a good time. Thank you. Thank you. And council member Servany. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I would just like to extend my thanks to Officer Crutcher for his service to the community and, and businesses and re residents as well. Um, and wish him the very best on his journey back to Montana. It's a beautiful state, except in the winter. <laughs> um, but we appreciate his service and um, his time here. Um, I'd also like to uh, kind of promote the Leadership Clark County elected official round robin event that I think each of us got emails for. Um, it's April 22nd and it runs from 4 to 5.30. And this year it'll be held at the Ripple Space on Waterfront. Um, but it's a good opportunity for all of the elected officials in Clark County to interact with um, up and coming uh, individuals in the, from the different colleges and from the different businesses and just kind of spread the word about who we are, what we do, um, as a community, um, you know, what our goals are as far as the development and the growth and um, just some networking that always helps and pass that information along. I had the opportunity to go um, to the CREDC anniversary dinner last week. Um, very well attended. It was right here at A&A, &A. Um, but a good turnout and a lot of good information that was shared there. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. So, Council, um, what I'd like to do is I would like to actually move the uh, ordinance presentation by Marty Snell ahead of staff reports. I don't see any reason to keep Marty on 
any longer than we need to. So if it's okay with the council, I'll go ahead and, and put uh, Mr. Snell ahead of the staff reports. Okay. And um, so this uh, is for ordinance 2022-02 land use application fees update. And it's uh, again, the presenter will be uh, Marty Snell with McKay Supposito. Marty. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So this is a, a long and longer follow-up from work that we've been engaged with the city. So a year ago, I was in front of the council and the mayor with the building fee table that was adopted last March. Um, and this time around, it's on the land use application fees that the city charges for land development. There is an ordinance that actually covers a couple other minor items, and I'll ask Maria and Bronson to weigh in on a couple of those. I think one of the council members asked about the special event fee, which is it is in the administrative fee section of the uh, fee table. It's, there's an underlying special event fee at $50, Maria talked about. Um, and there's also um, a clarification to the the building fees that were adopted last year, uh, we adopted uh, a two cycle old version of the building valuation table that's adopted in the International Code Council. So the amendatory section in this ordinance brings that valuation table to current current rates. So that's part of the actual ordinance. It's, a, it's an amendatory section. But the balance of the, the balance of the ordinance is really in adopting the new um, planning fees. And I'm at a disadvantage, unfortunately, where my my internet shut down. I, I, I told Jeff that I almost had to do this like on a phone, but I was able to connect to the internet, but I can't get to my, my any of my drives. So I'm just gonna be speaking from a sent document, which is the actual fee table. Um, I don't have, the um, spreadsheet that I shared with council in December to kind of compare and contrast current to, to proposed. But to suffice it to say though, that I think generally speaking, a lot of the fees um, are going down somewhat because most of the actual review work is done by your consultant planner, uh, WSP. So a lot of these fees have a footnote the footnote is number two, and it, and it basically requires a, a cost recovery agreement for the substantive review that's done by WSP. So this um, fee table, it's the third, kind of the third category down, it's the planning fees. So we have um, some annexation fees. The initial 10% the initial petition is $280. And then the 60% petition is where you hold a public hearing, consider zoning of property in any city indebtedness, and that's that's slightly higher fee at, at $500, and then $60 per parcel. I I don't think any of the appeal fees change necessarily. So there's appeals of type one, two, and three decisions. Um, you have your boundary line adjustment uh, at $425 plus $75 a lot. Your comprehensive plan amendment and rezone, it's, it's actually a $380 is, is very cheap, but the, the expense for an applicant will be in the cost recovery agreement that's executed between the applicant and, and WSP in this case. So just kind of get moving forward, um, there are three conditional use permit types. There's um, a minor, major, and an amendment. And those are um, 280, 900, and 320. The critical area review or uh, the critical areas are per critical area, whether it's a wetland or habitat area or steep slope, um, that's $340 per critical area type. And then you have an exemption and a variance, which are $60 and $180. Um, there is a development agreement charge at $1640, which is actually a pretty good deal. That occupies a lot of the council's time, staff, and 
oftentimes involves the city attorney. Um, the home occupations, the, there is a type one and type two. The type one is, is kind of a, a lesser degree. Um, a type two involves a little bit more. And if a site visit is warranted, and I would imagine this being something like um, a, a setback or a sign or something where a site visit is required by city staff, um, that's that's an additional $104. You get to the land division ordinance, the land division fees, which is either a short plat or a subdivision, and you have preliminary and final. Those are actually um, in line with the smaller agencies in North Clark County. So those um, those amounts at a thousand forty, three thousand, three twenty, and nine twenty, and then there's a per lot cost. They're pretty much in keeping with other smaller agencies in North County. Um, legal lot determination is 425 plus 75 a lot. That's like the boundary line adjustment. We have non-conforming use. Um, an expansion or alteration of a previously approved uh, non-conforming use is a little bit more expensive because you you'll have to dig into the old the old non uh, the old um, uh, determination and dig up what 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 was what were the circumstances at the time. Um, planning director review or determination um, that's a one hundred seventy dollar charge. That's roughly a couple hours of time. Um, we have post decision reviews. If you're not familiar with a post decision review, it's after after a say a subdivision has been approved and there's a change in in and what they want to do, they'll come around depending on the type of post decision review um, and how complicated it is. It, it is, it's either a one, two, or a three. A type three would be like a hearing, so you'd have to go back to the examiner. We have pre application conferences. Uh, there's a renoticing, there's a renoticing fee. Rezone is $240. Well, that's if you change like some some form of commercial zone to another form of commercial zone, but you're not changing comprehensive plan designations. Um, sign permit for the zoning compliance is sixty dollars. Site plan review is it's it's essentially your commercial development. And they're much like uh, the subdivision costs that are running. Your shoreline master program, there's a substantial development permit, a condition use permit or variance. Those are those are pretty extensive permits and they would involve WSP's cost recovery agreement. Um, SEPA is something that is required typically when there's a, you know, SEPA is the State Matter Mental Policy Act. And depending on, you know, the, the triggering um, mechanism of, of an underlying development, you'll, you'll trigger SEPA. Then we've got temporary use permits that are fairly, they're fairly um, simple, straightforward. There's a tree removal permit. Um, and depending on the tree removal in, in your tree removal ordinance, you may trigger WSP's involvement. And then finally, we have variances. Variances like something if you want to modify a setback, you know, ten if ten foot of a ten foot setback is required, you want to modify it to eight feet. You'd go through a, a, a variance. Or if you want to do something greater than a, a certain percentage, it gets type two or type three. So, and then your engineering fees are are still um, those are unchanged from from the previous. Uh, adopted fees. So I will conclude my kind of running through this quickly and we'll take any questions or any, any clarifications need to be made. And I do appreciate your staff's help on this. Maria had a, a crack staff in this gal, Desi. She went through the ordinances and had to sift through things that were adopted in various parts of the La Center Municipal Code and really helped out. And then Bronson, of course, does great work with the ordinance itself.
So I'm done with my presentation. Thank you for that, Marty. Uh, appreciate you going through that. Um, Council, any questions or discussion on what Mr. Snell just reported on? I have no questions. I will have to say it was pretty thorough in my reading. So thank you for that. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank. Thank you, Marty. It was it was very um, thorough, and I I found it very helpful. Good. Thank you. And real quick, the the, the um I kind of glossed over the, the the building the building fee issue. Um, it was something that we adopted last year, and I think between the time we adopted it and now, there was kind of a change of heart. And I know Brian Cast is your municipal works director, you know, concerned about kind of losing ground on building valuations where you know costs of, of construction are escalating. And when you're on not a, a single cycle, but two cycles removed from the current uh, cal calculated valuations, you, you're you're not picking up that that valuation of building. So you're kind of like systematically losing ground with with building permit fees. So we wanted to we wanted to capture um, the valuation tables, you know, in current rates rather than you know one cycle or two cycles behind. And those are those can be somewhat you know um, the at the maybe at the end of the year or the next budget cycle you kind of look at your costs and your revenues and if and if you're running a little a little hot on the revenue side you can adjust by a, like some kind of um, factor for the valuation tables like you know 80 percent or 90 percent but oftentimes people stay at the 100 percent because there's um, I think there's kind of locally built in um, factors, if that makes sense. So it does, does make sense. <clears throat> okay. Very good. Thank you, Marty. Yep. Claire, could you please pull up the staff report and get down to the recommended motion, please? It's in the staff report. I have it up, but I'm willing to do it if everybody's ready. Okay. Well, if we get a motion, uh, the northern. Oh, excuse me. This is a public hearing, so I have. Or Bronson, <laughs> is this a public hearing? This is. Correct. We should we should uh, see if there's any public testimony. Yep. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself here. Okay. So yes, this is an ordinance, so it is a public hearing. Um, so if there's no other questions or further discussion by the council. I will go ahead and open it up for the public hearing. It is now 733. If any member of the public would like to comment, please give us your name and address. And if you could limit your comments to three minutes. <clears throat> and you'll have to remember to unmute yourself if you're trying to speak. Okay, not hearing anyone coming forward, I will close the public comment, turn it back over to the City Council for any uh, final discussions, concerns, questions, comments. I'm glad, Mr. Mayor, we don't have any dog or cat license fees going up, because sometimes that'll just raise all kinds <laughs> of racks with people. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Very good. Well, if there's no further discussion, if I could please get a motion. Mayor, I'd like to uh, give a motion uh, on approving ordinance 2022-02, adding a special event fee, amending the ICC building valuation reference to adopt the current valuation and adopting a fee table for land use applications. Second. 
It's been moved and seconded to approve ordinance 2022-02, adding a special event fee, amending the ICC building valuation reference to, to, to adopt the current valuation and adopting a fee table for land use applications. Clerk, could I get a roll call vote, please? Council Member Fox? Yes. Council Member Casper? Yes. Council Member Boyle? Yes. Council Member Strobin? Yes. Council Member Servany? Yes. The ordinance passes unanimously. Thank you again, Marty. Appreciate all your hard work and efforts on this. Thank been, you, Mayor. Uh, Thank you for being patient. It wasn't, oh. it wasn't easy with our, our COVID interruptions and in my and in my health scare last year. So I do appreciate yes. your patience. No, it's been you did a great job, Marty. Again, I appreciate all your hard work. Uh, Thank you so much, it's been sir. A good process. Yep. Yes. Okay. You guys have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Thank you. So next on the agenda are staff reports. The first staff report this evening will be from Chief Richardson. It'll be the police staff report. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council. Um, just so uh, before I begin, I wanted to kind of explain where these numbers come from. I know there have been some comments on uh, social media. Uh, just so you know, the police officers, we go out and we take uh, reports on the field. Sometimes we take crime reports. Uh, and sometimes we take reports that aren't crimes. Uh, we call them incident reports or informational reports. And those are sometimes, uh, it could be as minor as uh, somebody calls and complains about uh, their neighbors making too much noise, but they don't want to do anything about it. We take an information report, or it could be uh, uh, they've had a fight at the school on the playground or off the campus somewhere. And the parents call and ultimately they decide they don't want to have anything done. They're going to handle it. Uh, parent to parent. And so instead of taking an assault report, we take an information report. And then there's some reports that are crime reports. And that's where the officer actually takes the crime report and he does the crime report online. He codes the offenses. And then uh, when he submits that report for approval, either uh, Sergeant Olson or myself look at it and make sure it meets all of our criteria and make sure the elements of the crime are uh, in the police report. And then that a report is approved and once it's approved it's locked can't do anything with it in order to fix it you got to write a supplemental report to the original report and then it gets transferred electronically down to the sheriff's department and the sheriff's department has a, a, a clerk down there that does the coding to make sure that we do our mandated reporting to the, the state and the, the federal government and uh, that's called NIVERS so NIVERS clerk goes through all the coding of all the police reports that are offenses and says, okay, these all look right, but this might be different, or hey, I've read the report and uh, the officer coded it wrong or, or whatever. And that information is then submitted uh, once a month in a, a batch file up to the state, and the state uh, uh, locks it in and into their system that we have electronic access to. We can go up and we can look at the numbers and we can't change the numbers. The only people that can change the numbers for us is uh, if there's an error or something, it would be the records clerk uh, at the county. So uh, that's kind of how the system works. And then about April of every year, all that information is collected by WASPEC, which is the Police and Sheriff's Association. And they publish a report every year called Crime in Washington. And like, uh, they haven't done 2021 yet, but it'll be out. And you can go down into any of them, and I believe they're in there since the 1980s. Uh, that you can go and look at crime reports and uh, look at crime data and you can actually drill down and, and look at each individual agency and jurisdiction throughout the state of Washington. So it's all a public record. It's all there. Uh, if anybody has any questions, one of the things that gets confusing uh, uh, to, to me, but to, to a lot of people that don't work with this every day is in the old days, we used to have a, a thing called UCR, Uniform Crime Reports. That was the FBI's first uh, crack at this, and I think it's been around since the 1930s, 1940s. But when you went out and you took a police report, um, you had you took one police report, and 
every police report only had one crime that the government uh, that they reported in the government it was in a hierarchy. So if you had a, a robbery and an assault and the robbery was was the top crime in this hierarchy, the robbery got reported. So you'd have uh, the, the one crime would get reported. When they went to Nybers, I think it's up to 10 crimes and get reported. So theoretically, an officer can go to the scene of a house uh, and somebody can have uh, two cars in their driveway. Somebody breaks the window in the car and steals something out of the car. That's a vandalism or a theft. So now you've got two crimes where you used to only old days, you have one crime. And then they go next uh, to the other car in the driveway and they do exactly the same thing. Well, you, now you got four crimes. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind uh, as we talk about these. But uh, at the end of the day, I go up every month, pull the information off the, the state website, and then I have to go back through and I, I read every report, I read every call history to make sure that, hey, are the officers going out and taking reports when they need to? Um, and then I have to uh, go through every report again and kind of match up uh, the number that is in the, the report versus the, what the actual police report is. So that's kind of how we get where, where we are. So for the month of February, and uh, just so you know, that's why it takes about uh, a week uh, to 10 days for this, depending on how busy the Sheriff's Department is, uh, for them to actually bundle up these cases, review everything, and then uh, batch file it up to the state. So we, uh, if it's uh, uh, into January, we generally won't see those numbers posted until around February 10th, sometimes less, sometimes more, but obviously the Sheriff's Department, uh, this is not the priority for them. Uh, they have a lot of other things that a records unit has to do. So for the month of February 2022, we had one, one intimidation. Uh, we had three thefts from motor vehicle. We had three larcenies that are all uh, category as all other and six vandalisms. Again, some of those six vandalisms are breaking the window to get in the car to commit the theft from motor vehicle. So when you see those numbers, uh, a lot of them are uh, uh, that type of number. And then some of them were the vandalisms, I believe in the park where they painted up some fences and the signs and stuff. So in February, 2022, we had a total reported crime, crime reports of 13. And uh, let's say hypothetically, we took 30, 30 reports that month. That would tell you that out of that 13 reports, the rest of them were informational reports or some other type of report that didn't qualify as a crime report. And uh, compare this to February, 2021, which we also had 13 crime reports, but in that month we had a burglary, seven thefts from motor vehicle, uh, two motor vehicle thefts of parts, two other larcenies and one identity theft. One of the things that continues to be a trend, which is uh, good for us, is as you uh, we mentioned before, we did have a suspect that we knew that was doing a lot of the thefts of motor vehicles, stealing cars in our community. Uh, the person was arrested uh, around December 2nd, and then he was released on bail, and then he recently got arrested again. Um, but uh, we've been keeping a close eye on him, and the officers have been doing a good job, not only us, but Richfield, CCSO in Washougal, because we know who this person is, that we haven't had an auto theft, uh, knock on wood, uh, since uh, at least before December 2nd. So where everybody else is having auto thefts, or, uh, for some reason in our jurisdiction, we had about 20 auto thefts uh, last year, I, mean, I think 18 auto thefts and two attempts. So we, we're doing good uh, compared to other jurisdictions as far as auto thefts. And if you look in the paper, uh, trends, thefts from vehicles or thefts of catalytic converters, uh, all over the news, it's a nationwide problem. Now, if we go to page two, which is the uh, crime incidents, generally we're tracking the property crimes because that's what people most are most interested in, number one. And number two, it's that our most prevalent crime or property crimes is uh, just obviously a, a list. And I don't want to go through each one, but you see a vehicle prowl where they've taken something out of a vehicle and broke the window to do so, which predominantly through the most of the year is very unusual. Most of the time people, they bypass cars and they uh, go into the cars where the door is unlocked. But in this particular case, and I think it was three vehicle prowls all in the same day, uh, all within close proximity, two at the school. And I believe there's one on Cedar that uh, the person actually broke the window to go in the car to steal something. And uh, again, we've had, you know, the online theft, uh, where 
somebody bought something online and it didn't get shipped, that's a theft. Uh, a house with a broken window, uh, that's a, uh, a theft or a, a vandalism. And if uh, you go through it, you can just see that uh, there was a ring stolen from inside a resident uh, residence last fall sometime, and they just got around to reporting it. And obviously, there was a catalytic converter attempt. And since they didn't steal it, the officer took the report as a vandalism because they obviously vandalized the car to get it halfway stolen, but then it was interrupted and they ran off with uh, the catalytic converter. And then the, uh, the last one is a porch pirate, which uh, again is another one of those uh, issues that's very common across the United States. And that's why you see all these lockers now being uh, uh, put in convenience stores and uh, 7-Elevens and uh, FedEx and all these other places where you can actually have Amazon uh, ship your package to the closest locker facility. I mean, you go to a locker facility to actually get it, to try to reduce all these thefts. And we had the one arrest, and this was an intimidation arrest, uh, DV related, domestic violence related intimidation arrest. So that was for February, 2022. And if you go to page four, sorry, I'm going uh, fast. I know we have a lot to cover tonight. That's just your monthly calls for service. And it's what you would expect. Uh, community initiated uh, calls where people are calling us are, are higher than obviously our officer initiated calls. Uh, that's just because of the, the staffing that we have now. It's much less than we had a year ago or 24 months ago. And so as you have fewer police officers out there, they're generating uh, fewer police initiated calls for service. And remember, a call for service can be anything. Um, so uh, it's a very broad uh, category of uh, incidents. And then if we do a monthly comparison on page five, uh, you'll see the calls for service. And you can see again that uh, calls for service are decreasing uh, because of police initiated activity, but even the community initiated activity somewhat is starting to go down. Uh, I still believe that some of that's got to do with COVID and uh people are outside away from the home now they're not uh you know a year ago we were locked inside the house and now we're not and and that's why you see that dramatic uh, decrease of total calls for service between 2021 and 2022 for the month of february and i'm going to turn the page here and this is just uh written reports by source and as you can see like uh, i've said in prior occasions uh, most of our uh, police reports are community initiated that means somebody's calling us for report uh, officer initiated reports are uh, the next ones. Uh, they're usually between they're you know six or eight to ten a month per officer. And as you can see that uh, that's what we have right now. We had uh, eight uh, this month and uh, six last month. And then we're going to go to the last page. And this is just community messaging. And just to remember that uh, please keep your valuables uh, out of your car because that's still the number one issue we have on our city. You leave cell phones and wallets and stuff in your car or even your car keys, somebody's going to come along and open up the car door or break your window and take that. So if you can lock up uh, those items at night in your house, that would help. Uh, for those that have been following the um, police reform legislation, uh, the governor signed uh, Bill 1719. This is now allows the police departments to use uh, reasonable force when we're going to go uh, to some type of civil detention. So we have to take somebody into custody and detain them to get them a mental health evaluation or to take a child into custody for protective reasons. Uh, we have the right to use force to do that. Remember the last year, the legislators took that away from us and we couldn't use force and, and uh, it became very chaotic for not only the police officers out in the field, but the mental health uh, evaluators out in the field trying to get uh, help from the police department. And they were told no, that uh, we couldn't help them. And the governor also signed Bill uh, 1735, uh, which allows uh, police officers to take, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I swapped swappies and I apologize. So uh, 1719, uh, remember last year, the uh, state legislators outlawed all 40, mil, 40 caliber weapons. Well, that accidentally when they did that, they outlawed shotguns and we can use shotguns with beanbag rounds for less lethal. But they also outlawed the 40 millimeter launchers which shoot a rubber bullet, which are both uh, good alternatives for less lethal prior to having to use lethal, lethal force. So they recognized that mistake and they corrected it this year. So that's the bill 1719. Again, 1735 is a civil commitment. And 
uh, after this was uh, actually written, uh, this is um, the bill 2037 and the governor just signed that uh, end of last week. And this allows police officers to use physical force uh, to take somebody into uh, investigative detention. Uh, remember last year I told you that if there was a suspicious person and you called the police and said, hey, this guy's walking around these cars and we've had a issue with burglaries in the area and you know we needed a probable cause to stop the person and they walk away and let's say we get them a, a couple of blocks away and we stop the person matching the description, we could stop them, we couldn't use force and if they didn't want to stop, they could just walk away. We, there's nothing we could do about it. So they finally have recognized that, gee, that's not really what our intent was. Uh, so we now can use force and they've re lowered the, uh, the standard of reasonable suspicion back where it was before. So we can now do deten uh, investigative detentions. We do that all the time. We detain somebody and then we have the, uh, go get the witness, have the witness, we drive them in the police car and we do a, what's called a, a field show up where we say, is that the person? And we read a statement to them and they say, yes, yeah, the person. And we continue to investigate the crime. And then obviously the, the one that did not pass, uh, that's the, the pursuit bill 5919. We still can't uh, pursue cars for a lot of reasons. So it gets kind of complicated, but if, uh, if we think, if you call us and somebody's breaking in your car to steal it and we can get there soon enough, we can use reasonable force to make it investigated detention. And, uh, but if they get in the car and drive away in your stolen car, then we have to let them go. That's basically the gist of what the new law is. Now we're still, uh, there was, uh, they tabled it. It didn't even get out of committee. Uh, we got out of committee and they diverted it. Uh, so that, that's something will come up year after year, but there was a lot of, uh, people that were opposed to trying to relax the restrictions on police pursuits. Uh, and there's a lot of video out there now of uh, people ramming cars and ramming uh, park cars to get out, get away from the police car and take off and we just have to let them go. So that's kind of the state of uh, policing right now. I can tell you that uh, overall it was a good year, uh, I think for policing compared to last year, but there's still a lot of things that uh, come up every year that uh, they're trying to change. And those are going to cause us some, some concern in the future. And uh, there's some things that we need to revisit every now and then to, to make sure that we have the tools we need to do enforcement in a professional manner. So that's kind of where we are today. Thank you. Chief, I just finished building a, a PowerPoint presentation for CCSO staff on 1735 and 2037, if you're interested. I'd, be lo I'd love to have it. Chief, uh, speaking of tools, what uh, what type of training has the current officers received in the last year or so um, at this point? Uh, for a specific topic or anything? Well, actually, for anything, but really a specific topic of uh, Narcan. Have the Narcan? officers received that training? Yes. Have they received that training yet? You know, I'll have to go back and look. I don't know if they have. Uh, we did in Battleground, um, um, so I have to go back and look. I, I can tell you we're, we're mandated to have 24 hours of training every year. Uh, we exceed that because we not only do training internally, but we do it with other agencies. And every training day we have is 10 or 11 hours. So even if we get uh, two or three training days, we've already met the mandate. We had two hours of mandatory crisis intervention training last year. Um, but I will find out about the night the Narcan and uh, why, we, if we don't have it, we should have it. And, and yeah, it, that, that the reason of that uh, question is because I, I had a, a friend, a, a pretty good friend whose son OD'd on fentanyl yes. uh, up in King County. And so I'm being educated in this drug and what's happening to our kids. Right. And I would really, really beg our emergency services to be able to help any kid that goes into an OD or something like that along the lines from Narcan or from fentanyl, uh, along with the officers and the emergency personnel that come in contact with it. Right. A, a great, great comments. Great idea. I can tell you that uh, not only will we check into that, but uh, there is a, uh, I don't know if it's still around, it was around a year or two ago, but uh, they had a needle exchange program in uh, downtown Vancouver uh, and it where 
people that are addicts could go and exchange their dirty needles for clean needles so they don't get hepatitis and all these other diseases where they end up in an, uh, an ER room where we as the public are treating them for much more serious diseases. And part of that program was that they would also issue Narcan not only to the person that was the addict, but also the family members. And they it's been used quite often where a family member will come across or another addict will find one of their friends that's shot up and, and they're overdosed and they actually administer to Narcan because you can't hurt mm -hmm. somebody uh, using Narcan. I mean, it right. either works or doesn't hurt them. But uh, right. we are always trained uh, how to use it. And the one thing they are always trained about is people do become combative. And uh, sometimes because they're mad because you've uh, ruined their, their high. But I think it's a great, uh, great tool and I'll, I'll pull up on it. Perfect, thank you. Um, uh, another quick question uh, uh, to the same topic there. What, what is, do, do our officers, are they involved in helping educate the children in the school system? I, I know they're their own entity, but are we involved with that at all? Uh, not really. Um, the relationship with our, with, between our police department and the school is uh, not where I'd like to see it be. Um, it, they kind of do the school kind of does their own thing and we kind of do our own thing. And uh, I don't see a lot of interaction uh, like I did with other other police departments that, that I'm familiar with or worked with, you know, uh, school resource officers, uh, those kinds of things that were actually in the school day to day. We just don't have that kind of uh, uh, communication with the schools. I'd, I'd love to have it. Um, but sometimes there's some roadblocks that are outside our control. Um, especially when you read the paper the last couple of days where, uh, you know, universities don't want police officers on campus anymore. It's the same kind of, uh, now I haven't heard that here at the center, but I have in other jurisdictions I've worked in. And it's something like you build a relationship. First, they don't want you there. And then you build a relationship and they really want you there. And then kind of over this last year or so, we've kind of, kind of gone back the same direction because of some of the anti-policing. Uh, Again, I haven't seen that in our, uh, school district. I certainly don't want to suggest that, but I, I think our relationships could be a lot better than they are. Okay. And so how should we facilitate a better relationship with the school so that we can start those type of uh, conversations and education of the children? Well, uh, or at least assist uh, in it. Sure, sure. Obviously, the, the, the easy, not the easiest, the best would uh, get this uh, school resource officer program is, uh, is a great way to do that. Um, but remember that um, number one is you need the buy-in of this, you need the buy-in of the, to get the grant to fund a school resource officer, or if we fund it ourselves, uh, you have to make sure that you've got, you buy in with the parents, buy in with the school district, you've got to have an officer that's willing to go in there it's the right fit for the school. They've got to go through all kinds of training uh, in order to do that. And uh, re also remember that then you have to use that officer, uh, depending on how you have the shift schedule worked up, the augment uh, regular patrol during the summer or school holidays, or there's things we could work out logistically. So yes, you could do it. Uh, but I, my experience right now is I think Battleground has got two school resource officers. We may only have one, but they have a budget for two. Uh, I think, I believe the Sheriff's Department got rid of theirs. Ridgefield does not have a school resource officer that's a city police officer. And uh, I don't know about Camas, Walnut, Sugar, where they are. But, uh, and I, so those are something we have to look at. I mean, we it's possible, but we have to have the staffing, number one. And it's, you know, it's like anything else. You, generally, in this state, you recruit seasoned police officers to be school resource officers. In the southeast part of the country, it's very common for them to hire right off the street somebody to be a school resource officer. So, uh, but in this part of the country, we hire generally experienced officers to be, we select experienced officers to be school resource officers, and then we fill behind that body with a, a, a new recruit. Yeah, no, and, and I completely appreciate that and understand that. I, I wasn't after the fact of getting a school resource officer. I was more along the lines of establishing that relationship to where we can have an officer do a guest appearance and talk with kids and help educate, as long as the uh, education system was okay with it. So opening up a dialogue with them would probably be a good start, correct? Sure, and I agree with that. Well, the Center, Center United also has had numerous um, programs on 
a variety of, of issues and topics. Um, and I, I believe it just recently had one that was dealing with the, um, the current overdosing that was occurring, but they've been a, a really good resource for the community. And I, I agree with it, what everybody's saying. I, I'm a member of Listener United. And uh, so I agree. One of the issues we do have with uh, a policing schedule that we work that's very common is these officers move uh on their shifts throughout the week with different days off and it's you know so for a school district that wants to have an officer there every tuesday between uh nine and ten to do something it's very difficult to do when you have a, a rotating shift so, mm -hmm. sure sure what, well what about you chief would you be willing to go in and talk to some of these kids yeah i've always uh you know when I uh, reach out to the superintendent and the schools and remember when we had the protest when we had the protesting in front of the school I went went in and met with the principal and the, the superintendent I'm always available but yeah I don't have an uh, objection to doing that that's great all right thank you okay sir thank you I believe Clark County Fire and Rescue may also have um, staffing that can help in that area too Yeah, that, that's good to know, Liz. Thank you. Okay, Chief, thank you. Good report. Um, any other questions for the Chief this evening also? Thank you, Chief. Okay. Um, we'll move on to uh, staff. the next staff report. Uh, there's actually two finance staff reports this evening. The first one will be presented by the Director of Administrative Services, Maria swinger -Inske. And after that, we will have a report from the city um, accountant. It's, uh, I think we'll go ahead and have um, Maria present her report, and then I'll ask the council if you want to take a, a short break. I think uh, Riley's report is pretty long, so we might want to consider taking a short break. It's now eight o'clock. So why don't you go ahead, Maria? Good evening, Mayor Thornton and City Council. Tonight, I bring you the March finance staff report. Uh, the February sales tax disbursement was $60,571 compared to $82,464 in 2021. And Desi Ellinger-Nelson attended two grant workshops uh, this past month. Uh, the first was an introduction to requests for proposals, which was offered by AWC. And the second was entitled Grant Funding for Body Worn Cameras, and that was sponsored by Lexipol. I attended a training for Public Records Act litigation, which was sponsored by RMSA, which is our insurance carrier. And uh, next, you have the gambling tax for February. Um, so, so far we brought in 216, almost $217,000 so far this year. And uh, before I end, I do want to let the council know that I did send you a new link for the executive session. It came in tonight about 630. So if you could please check your email um, so that you are clicking on the right link tonight. Just a short report for you tonight. Are there any questions? Yeah, Maria, what was the projected uh, income for the gambling taxes uh, for 2022? I'm oh, sorry, it was $100,000 a month. So 1.2. So 1.2. Yeah. Okay. And, all right. Thank you, Maria. Absolutely. Any other questions? Thank you, Maria. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Maria. So, Council, it's now uh, 8.04. Uh, we have one more staff report to do and then the executive session. Uh, does any of the Council members want to take a short uh, five-minute break or are we good to go? I would like a five-minute break, please. Okay. Um, sure. Well, let's go ahead and let's see. It's uh, five after, so at 8.10 we can resume the meeting. Um, We'll take a quick recess. Thank you.
Is Maria still with us? I am. Ah, oh, perfect. You were talking about the second email that came through, the one uh, 646 tonight? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, it's now um, 810, so, so we'll end our recess. Hopefully every all the council members are back. Um, just real quick, uh, council member Boyle. Oh yes, I'm here, sorry, I must have just missed you. Okay, council member Fox. I'm sorry, I'm here. Okay. Uh, Council Member Strobin is here, Council Member Servini is here, and Council Member Casper. Are you with us? Are you here with us, Ms. Cas Council Member Casper? I see you there. Yep, okay. I'm here. Okay, thank you. All right, so we'll resume the meeting. Uh, next on the agenda then is our second finance report for this evening. Uh, this staff report will be presented by our city accountant, Mr. Riley Rivera. Riley? All right. <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, season finale, the, th the thrilling conclusion of my uh, 2021 quarterly reports. Uh, so if you've been watching these, uh, uh, the previous ones, I would usually talk about what happened the quarter and uh, provide my estimates for the rest of the year. So now we're uh, done with the estimates. We're just going to look at how we uh, did with our budgets to actuals and uh, not really going to do a quarterly focus on Q4. We're just going to look at the annual stuff. So. Everybody see my screen? It's like starting out with some highlights. Uh, so, you know, we just did hear uh, Bob talk about our uh, revenue uh, issues and 2021 was a great year, but uh, you know, we had a almost a million dollar surplus in uh, the general fund and uh, across all of our funds, we had about a three and a half million dollar surplus. Uh, a lot of this is delayed capital projects, particularly across the non-general fund ones. 
uh, and even in the general fund, uh, more than half of that is uh, some of that ARPA money, which has some reservations on how it can be spent. So, uh, you know, a lot of this money is kind of already spoken for. So even though there was a big surplus, uh, it's not like we're going to keep having surpluses year after year based on what we've seen. Uh, but uh, it's still everything looked pretty good last year. Uh, so we're at a new address thanks to a big grant we got in 2021. Uh, so we moved our buildings. I now have a window. Uh, so we're doing great. Uh, I, I, if you haven't uh, seen the new City Hall yet, everything looks amazing. Uh, there's a lot of new faces down at City Hall. We've had a, quite a bit of staff turnover. Uh, and we also have some new City Council members. So things are quite a bit different since I started about a year ago. Uh, and as, as I previously mentioned, we got uh, $547,000 in ARPA funds. That was 72,000 was from 2020. And then the $475,000 disbursement from last, uh, from 2021. And uh, so we're expecting another disbursement this year. And we are still in discussions on how to best spend this money. Uh, and so we're starting out looking at the general fund revenue. So uh, we got three columns here. We got what we had in the original budget, what we had in the actuals throughout the year, and then a column showing the variance. Uh, so I didn't actually create last year's budget. So there are a few occasions throughout this report where I just really won't have the answer. Uh, sometimes uh, things were a little vague, but uh, do my best to interpret things. So starting at the top, uh, we're gonna skip down to the retail sales and use taxes. That's a big jump of our actuals compared to what the budget was. A lot of that was due to the new uh, middle school that was built. That was something like a $50 million project. And uh, so, you know, even though we don't have a huge sales tax percentage coming to the city, a huge project like that brings in a lot of money. So uh, we were way over our uh, original expectations right there. Uh, a lot of stuff was kind of right on the line with what we had budgeted. Uh, moving on down to the intergovernmental revenues, that 475,000 or the five, what was it, 547, uh, that was not included in the original budget. Uh, so that is well, majority of our why we that uh, such a big green number right there. Uh, so overall, this was uh, some of the highest revenues in total that we've seen uh, going uh, since about five years ago. But if you look at that revenue five years ago, that was about $3 million in just card room revenue. Uh, and you know, the rest kind of dispersed everywhere else. So while some of these other things like the, you know, the ARPA funds and uh, all of our licenses and permits that we had throughout the year, they kind of saved our skin a little bit this year. But uh, yeah, things look a lot different than they, uh, than they have in the past. But uh, overall- Real quick, Riley. Yep. Real quick, Riley, the intergov revenues, you've got a number of 769.049 for the 2021 actual, but mm -hmm. note number two, it's saying that it's combined for 547K. But, um, yeah. Can you explain that to me? Sure. So uh, in the original intergov revenues, there's a number of things that we get. Uh, most of them are fairly small, uh, some like the state shared revenues and things like that. So what the estimate for the original state shared estimates came out to about $180,000. The 547 is on top of that. So, you know, in total, there was a variance of 587. So that tells you that there was, uh, you know, essentially what they were originally thinking they were going to get on the year of the uh, state shared revenues, things like that. They got an extra 40 grand and then this extra 547 in these uh, ARPA funds. And of course, I forgot to look at what ARPA stands for again, uh, but it is a uh, federal relief money related to COVID. There's some restrictions on how it can be spent. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that does. It, cool. um, and the 475 that you're saying it's in 2022, that's not included in this budget, correct? In that is correct. Report. So this is just the uh, 2021s compared to what was. Yeah, so there is, uh, in our 2022 budget, we did include that 475 in there. Uh, so if nothing else, our end of the year variance will hopefully look a little smaller unless we get some other sort of gigantic bonus, but I don't see how that's going to happen. Uh, moving, Thanks, Ryan. Yep. Moving on from the revenue. Uh, I'm doing a summary of all of the departments on this one. In the past, I had just kind of broken them down by department. Uh, but especially when we're looking at these overall yearly revenues, I think it makes a lot of sense to look at the big picture here. Because uh, there's a few occasions where, you know, it just seemed like, all right, we budgeted for the same amount of staff, but they might not have been allocated across the uh, departments correctly 
or uh, as they were originally budgeted. So looking at all of the departments in the general fund as one, uh, you know, the first thing you'll see is pretty much everything is green uh, except for the services. So uh, the services in line two, that one uh, ended up being a bit over budget. There's a number of things that kind of go into this and uh, we'll kind of talk about it throughout the different departments. Uh, some of them are uh, some uh, positions that we had budgeted that would originally go in the salaries and benefits line ended up, uh, you know, they were paid as independent contractors sometimes because they were a temp or uh, just because that's what we ended up getting. And uh, so, you know, that will mean lower salaries, higher services. Uh, they were, we also had to, uh, you know, uh, our planners, some people that we had to use quite a bit more this year because we had so much building activity going on. Uh, back up to the salaries at the top, uh, those were under budget a little bit overall. Uh, but if you compare that to the benefits, which was way under budget, uh, that was just kind of an issue with these benefits to salary ratio. Uh, so there was a buffer that was included in the original 2021 budget based on a potential increased health care costs. We had some contract negotiations that happened this year. And uh, those, you know, we ended up getting a great deal on health care this year. So we didn't, uh, and uh, let's see what else did we have. There was also, as you know, we've talked about it, a number of people left throughout the year. And, uh, you know, when you retire, when you quit, whatever happens, you get your all your PTO. And I think with some of our contracts, I think for the police, they would also get a portion of their sick time as well. So this is, you know, it's not a severance payout. This is the uh, the funds that you had earned throughout your tenure that get paid out. And there was a number of those throughout the year. Uh, so in total, we were about 10% under uh, what we had uh, planned to spend on the year in 2021. And a majority of that uh, difference was due to salaries. Uh, so, you know, with that turnover, there would always be some temporary uh, vacancies, right? It takes a little bit of while to hire somebody. So there's a little bit of understaffing in some departments. So uh, that's kind of what a lot of the under budgeting on the expenses was. I'm going to move along to the by department breakdown now. And I apologize, this uh, graph got a little squished here, but <clears throat> starting with finance, uh, again, you'll see that you know, that ratio of why was the benefits so far under budget? I, I don't know the exact answer, but there's a, a number of factors that kind of went into that. We had some turnover there, uh, and that this was one of the departments that did see that less salary and more uh, services based on a, a temporary employee that was paid as an independent contractor, but we also had to pay a lot less to our outside CPA, CPA firm uh, because I'm just so amazing. And uh, there's also some HR, HR attorneys that were quite a bit under budget. So services was down quite a bit there. Uh, and then that capital line, you see it does zero for the year. There was a server upgrade that we figured we might as well just wait uh, until we got to the new building. And uh, having been, been doing a lot of cable management myself recently, is a very understandable thing to do. So excuse me, uh, Riley. Oh, Riley, yep. excuse me. So if you could just pause at the end of each page you're going through this yeah. pretty rapidly, but I think give the council members an opportunity to ask questions after each page rather than waiting to the very end. So hopefully that will be helpful. If you could just please pause for a few seconds. All right. Any questions, comments on the finance department? Well, hey, I, I'd like to find out when we're uh, like the services. I'd, I'd really like to see breakdowns of where we're spending money at, you know. Um, and then you said something on the previous page with the salaries and such and you were saying you know people that have left they're getting sick time they're getting uh their benefits paid out but it, i'm not i wasn't clear on where you guys expense that to but wouldn't that be expense to the benefits uh so no that, that would be salaries. Are... uh so if it's paid as a wage to the employee right if it comes in a check to them it's going to go in the salaries line item uh the things that go in benefits right you might call pto a benefit you might call sick time a benefit uh, but uh -huh. for expenditure purposes, what that means is uh, the money that we're paying on the employer portion of our payroll taxes or the, uh, you know, the employer portion of health care costs or, uh, you know, things like that. The employer portion of the uh, not the pension, but the PERS plan that we have. So, you know, sick time, that sounds like a benefit, but uh, realistically, that goes to salaries. Perfect. Thank you, Riley. Riley, I would like to chime in about the services question. So just kind of a brief overview of some of the things that go under services. So in addition to professional services, uh, which would like paying consultants, 
Um, we pay every like uh, advertising training our AWC insurance falls under in um, the services line item. Um, the phones, the electricity, the uh, utilities, the janitorial. So it's a big, broad range of a lot of different things fall under the services line item. Yeah, you could kind of okay. think of pretty much all of our expenditures other than salary benefits. Big things are capital. Uh, you know, if it's going to another government or it's an intergovernmental, then everything else pretty much falls in supplies or services. Uh, and if it's a physical item, it's a supply. If it's a non-physical item, it's a service. So yeah, utilities, uh, janitorial, everything like that falls into services. It's not just, you know, attorneys and HR and things like that, but those are some of the, the bigger portions of the, uh, of the budget. So, you know, it's easier to call out the one, you know, thing that equals $20,000 and the 30 little things that equal $20,000. So yeah, that's sure. But it also brings attention when, when we're not, when we don't have that information that it's being paid for utilities and such like that. And you've seen a number of $300,000 under services, it, it's going to catch your eyes real quick. Sure. So the explanation actually uh, uh, does help. Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, are we ready to move along? Any other questions? Uh, I could also go back up to the revenue if any or total expenditures. We got any questions on that? Yeah, this is Sean. I just had one question about the ARPA funds. Like, um, I was curious, are those funds, um, if they're not spent, do they have to be relinquished back to the government or how do those work? I believe there is a uh, time requirement on there, but it's uh, it's not coming up anytime soon. I can tell you that it's uh, I, if nothing else. I think we've got a few years. I don't have the exact number on hand. Uh, and, you know, we always we've discussed a, a sort of if we can't come up with anything else, one of the uh, possible uh, uses that are allowed for it is to uh, make up for lost revenues. And, uh, you know, if you look at the card room revenue, we certainly had lost revenue. So that's not necessarily what we are going to do with it. But if it comes down to, oh my gosh, the deadline is tomorrow, we have to spend this money, we could just kind of declare it that. So we are not in a, in trouble of losing these funds, I suppose. Riley, I'm just going to take a minute uh, to just do a little education on the ARPA funds. So there are actually four things that the ARPA funds can be used for. So the first one is uh, lost public sector revenues. The second one is public health and economic response. The third is premium pay for essential workers. And then the fourth is water, sewer, or broadband in infrastructure. So we, like he said, uh, we still have to decide where that money is used, but more than likely um, it will go into the lost revenue category. So there, you know, the, and we'll have discussions about uh, you know, some options for it, but it, those are the four things that it can be used on. Uh, thank you, Maria. That pretty much answered my next question. I appreciate that. All righty. Well, then we will move along down to the legislative department. Uh, this is a pretty small one. If you look at the total dollars that are being spent here, uh, so the service line item went over a little bit there, but uh, you know, in, in terms of total variances, $30,000 isn't that big of one. And uh, we were trying to come to the bottom of this and it seems, uh, it seems to be just a result of under budgeting. You know, these aren't, isn't like an unexpected expense. I think this was just something that was, uh, didn't make its way into the 2020 budget when it was prepared. Overall, pretty small, uh, pretty small expenditures there though. Any- Yeah, what, what are services in that one really? Uh, do I have that in front of me? I do. Let's see. So the uh, budgeted, uh, so the AWC insurance, that was the biggest one. That was $29,000 of that $38,000 in the budget. Uh, travel and training, uh, which is, you know, a lot of the travel and training is the, uh, you know, the courses people have to do. That was $7,000. Uh, so then there was a couple of other little small ones. Uh, and then in the actuals, the $29,000, uh, so 29,100 was budgeted for AWC insurance and 29,029 was spent. Uh, only 1,500 of the 7,000 of the training travel was spent, uh, but there's a professional services line for $20,000 uh, that was not included in the original budget. And uh, that's all the detail I have in front of me right now is just as professional services. And I believe 
from our prior discussions, it was someone that should have been in there. Uh, and then another 4,600 on advertising. We have our person that does legislative uh, work for us, uh, Lloyd Halverson. And so he falls under the professional service line item. I mean, he didn't get paid $20,000, but a big chunk, a chunk of that is his. Okay. I, I think I'd like to actually have that one emailed uh, if I could, or come down to the, the city hall there to take a look at it if possible. Sure thing. Thank you. Any others? Alrighty, on to the general government, uh, which we have renamed in 2022 the Municipal Court Department. Uh, and the reason being almost everything in this is municipal court related. Uh, and so, you know, they were under budget on our uh, expenditures and with all the COVID restrictions, the municipal court was just not seeing as many cases last year. Uh, I think there's even, you see a few news articles about cases being backlogged and things like that. Uh, there just wasn't as much uh, court happening, I suppose. So uh, there wasn't much going on in there. Questions, comments? All right, on to the police. So uh, this is another one where the uh, you know chief was, uh, we had budgeted a police officer for a, a chief being you know a salary position. We uh, got uh, Bob as a independent contractor. So that is, uh, that was one of the reasons why we had money that was, you know, in total what we had uh, wanted to spend, but allocated differently between salaries and services. Uh, you know, additionally, the services line item is where we uh, pay the uh, the outside, uh, you know, who else we contract with to provide police services. Uh, also, you know, due to our understaffing this year, our overtime as a, you know, ratio of overtime to general salaries ended up being quite a bit higher. So, uh, and you know, with the officers that left, there were some of those payouts that ended up in salary as well. So if you're wondering how we spent that much money on salaries with that few officers, there's, a, there's kind of a few little uh, background things in there. Uh, but overall, you know, we just didn't have as many officers on duty. So our expenditures ended up being a, a little bit lower, uh, including that capital one down there. You'll see, uh, you know, we didn't have the new officers to buy the tasers and vest for, so we uh, delayed that purchase. Questions, comments? Wow, thought I was going to no, that, that explains that. Right? Nope, that explains it. You, you explained it in the salary part at the beginning explained a lot of it because that was 74% uh, of the 931,000 that was actually spent. And there was only uh, three officers um, pretty much for nine months out of the year. So thank you. Yep. All right, uh, so planning and community development. Uh, and of course, on the topic of planning, our planning for 2022 budgeting, it was going to hopefully clear up the salary to benefit ratio thing. I, I just see that sticking out at me every time I look at these and kind of, kind of need, I don't know, bugs me. But overall, uh, the salaries were a little bit under what we had spent or what we had uh, budgeted. And uh, then the professional services is one that went over. Uh, and so we were looking at that one. And uh, again, this one appeared to be an expenditure that we had known we were going to make that didn't make its way into the budget for whatever reason. Uh, so I know WSP is like uh, one of these services that uh, makes up a pretty big one of them uh, and, you know, all of our city planners. Uh, and we also sense, you know, there was just so much planning and development going on this year. Uh, you know, we had to we had to spend a bit spend a bit more money. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten all that extra money coming in on our planning and uh, permits and such. So overall, we went over about uh, 30,000, not, uh, not a huge amount, but a little bit over. Questions and comments? On down to public works. Uh, and this one is kind of split between the public works operations and parks operations. Uh, and now that I think about that, I don't exactly know why. I think that's kind of the way it had been done previously, and I'm sticking with it. But uh, starting at the top with the public works operations, the salary uh, is quite a bit over budget there. Uh, and if you'd watched my presentations throughout last year, we had kind of talked to Matt, the uh, former uh, department head over there, and he had said that during the later months, you know, sometimes guys' hours get allocated a bit more to the uh, sewer and stormwater, and we didn't necessarily see that. Uh, so 
you know, we kind of knew who was going to be in that department. I'm not sure why this one uh, went over on their uh, variances, but uh, that's kind of why we looked at that, all these departments in total at the very beginning. It's because that kind of explains some of these, why was this one over, why was this one under? Uh, so that's why the uh, budgeting issues there. And then uh, down on the parks operations department, uh, there's a big uh, variance there on the services. And there was one and looking at the budget, uh, it just said $44,000 for professional services, and that wasn't spent. I can't actually give you any further detail on what that may have potentially been, uh, but that's one of the, the big differences there. That's, that's what that one is. Questions or comments? Moving along. All right, so that is actually the end of the general fund. Uh, so, you know, all the revenue that we were talking about at the beginning, uh, that was, uh, all these are going to be expenses that go against it. So from here on out, it's all of these kind of, uh, specific purpose funds that we're talking about. And these ones had a quite a bit of uh, surplus throughout the year because largely due to delayed projects, but we will start with the reserve fund. So the reserve fund, uh, is pretty much used for. If you know we have some sort of city emergency, right? If we are losing our revenues, uh, it's supposed to be maintained at. Uh, I think it's supposed to be about a years of expenses, and we're kind of working on how we're going to reword all that, going over a new reserve fund policy. Uh, but last year we were expected not to have to dip into this at all, and that indeed was the case. Uh, so they earned some uh, interest on the cash balances it has, and pays a little bit of bank fees. So uh, that's about all that happened in that fund. Uh, it's got about $4 million in its fund balance. Questions or comments? Down to the impact fees. Uh, and so the impact fees fund and the capital project uh, fund are kind of intertwined. Uh, based on the uh, what they do, right? Big capital projects, a lot of them are somewhat paid with impact fees, funds, uh, but not necessarily all of them. Uh, so when we get down to the expenditures, I'm just going to skip to the capital projects part. But starting at the top, those charges for goods and services. Uh, so these are impact fees for uh, park impact fees and traffic impact fees. And we had so much uh, construction, things like that going on that we greatly exceeded what we uh, were expecting on that. Uh, I don't think we're going to be getting a million dollars worth of impact fees every year. Uh, but yeah, there was a lot of construction going on last year. Uh, then miscellaneous, just interest in dividends. Uh, and then the non-revenues are school impact fees. Uh, and you see it says non-revenues and non-expenditures. And the reason is those are essentially just a pass-through. Uh, we get that money in and we give it straight to the school district. Uh, so one of the things that I was kind of curious about is how did these impact fees for traffic impact fees and park impact fees, how are those so high, school impact fees so low, uh, and that's based on how they're assessed. Uh, it looks like uh, to be assessed a school impact fee, those are only for residential, while uh, traffic and park are for any new construction. Uh, and then there was, uh, you know, if you don't count that non-expenditure to school impact fees, there was essentially no money spent out of this fund last year, uh, the some of the fund or the projects that we were going to be using our impact fees for, uh, you know, that were on the capital project list were scrapped or delayed until future years. Some are going to be happening this year. Some uh, questionable. We're still trying to get funding, things like that. So that's why it's a zero for capital there. Uh, and so we got about four million dollars in the fund balance of this one, and uh, this was about one point. $2 million of that, uh, you know, the city's overall $3.7 million surplus on the air. Questions and comments? All right. On to the capital projects fund. Uh, and I, looking back, I might have should have included that uh, capital project schedule that is usually included in the budgets and uh, kind of shown how those actually turned up. And uh, you can see how many of those have lines through them or ones that say delay till 2022. Uh, that being said, we still did spend a bunch of money. We still got a lot of money in. And a lot of that is due to this, uh, you know, the new city hall. I think that may have not originally been on the uh, budget uh, because I, actually I'm not sure about that. Don't quote me on that. 
but I think the uh, the income portion of it, at least, I think that was uh, one of the reasons why we were still so close to our income side, but not nearly as close on our expenditure side. But uh, the yeah, the intergovernmental funds that was uh, most of that was based on the Breezy Creek widening project and the new city hall building. The taxes that came in that's on REIT and uh, you know a houses are real expensive these days, and B there was a lot of new houses built last year. Uh, so that's why some of those were so much higher than we had uh, anticipated. And then down to the capital expenditures, uh, there were some that uh, either didn't happen or weren't completely done last year. Uh, so there was uh, we were quite a bit of under budget on the capital project expenditures. Questions, comments? I realize that you know everything is going to fall under capital, so this same format isn't the most. Uh, informative i suppose but uh consistency is always good so maybe i'll try to come up with a better way to show this in next year's but yeah anyways questions comments don't worry guys we're almost done you can stop thinking about numbers soon vehicle and equipment fund so the only thing that was in the budget last year is we were going to sell an old police car and get a new one uh we didn't do that it was delayed and uh, we got a little bit of uh interest and dividends in questions there all right on to our sewer operations fund look at all those notes so on the intergovernmental side if you're wondering what that is that is uh money that we get uh to treatment of biosolids from other nearby municipalities uh and then the charges for goods and services that is just the you know your sewer bill that you get every uh month or if you've gone to the direct pay, you don't actually get it every month and you just take it right out. Anyways, that was a little bit under budget, uh, but you know, overall we actually took in more than we had billed last year. I kind of looked at those uh, and that is a result of uh, Desi. I hear her on the phone every day. She has uh, been working on, you know, going through our old system and, you know, clearing out some old balances and things like that. Uh, so I think that was just a little bit under budgeted last year. Uh, miscellaneous interest dividends, uh, the operating expenditures, those were just a little bit under budget. Uh, the salaries and benefits are the big portion of that operating uh, budget. Uh, some were over, some were under, but uh, the, what's it called? The salary and benefits was the, uh, the big portion of that one, including the variances. That transfer out, by the way, that is $100,000 that goes to the sewer capital fund and then $400,000 that goes to the, uh, the general fund as an inner fund loan that uh, had been made over the years from the general fund to the sewer fund that is being repaid. And uh, overall, a $750 surplus. So I think that tells you right there that we are not overcharging you for your sewer bills, that we are uh, pretty close to right even on the money. Questions or comments? All right, uh, the sewer capital fund. So that transfer in, that's the one I just mentioned that came from the sewer operation fund and that is to fund future current projects. Uh, that transfer in, it's gonna be quite a bit bigger in 2022 due to some big projects that are coming up. Uh, and then the only other revenue that they would be getting is just some of those interest and dividends. There's a, I've been looking into our interest allocation process, but essentially everything in the uh, sewer capital and the sewer debt service just kind of get rolled into the sewer operations funds for uh for allocating those uh, the interest every month uh and then in the capital expenditures there was quite a bit less than uh what was expected so there was only a few plans on that one uh so there was going to be a general sewer update an actuator all the center road the SCADA upgrade and the la center school district pump station uh sewer plan update and actuator were delayed uh, the pump station was uh, completed last year, but is being paid this year. So that one didn't show up on last year's expenditures. Uh, and then the SCADA upgrade was done last year, and that was a little under budget as well. So uh, quite a bit less on the expenditure side there. Questions or comments? All right. Sewer debt service. So this is paying uh, a different loan, uh, not the inner fund loan. This is paying one to the Public Works Trust Fund. I think it's got about a $2 million balance on that loan. Uh, 
Uh, and so this is funded by our sewer development charges. Uh, we had a budget getting about 100 of those and we got 113. So, uh, you know, that's due to the construction is kind of why we went over a little bit there. I mentioned the interest allocation issue uh, and then that debt service payment. That's just a loan payment that gets uh, paid every year. So that one is uh, right on pretty much right what we were expecting for expenditures and a little bit extra funds on the income side. Questions, comments? I've got a note to make. Riley, do you know what the total debt, remaining debt is at this point? I don't have the exact number. I think it's around $2 million. Okay. If you want to uh, look at our last year's financial statements and subtract $257,000 <laughs> less a little bit of interest, that's how you get your number. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, and then the stormwater utility fund. Uh, so your, you know, the bills you get are split between sewer and stormwater. And uh, so while the sewer was a little bit under the stormwater, actually we got went over budget on that or over budget. We got more than we expected to on our charges for services. Uh, so you know, as I mentioned, we've been uh, really improving our processes. Uh, so trying to get people to sign up for direct pay, things like that. So I think that was just a. Uh, there were some definitely some big old balances that I saw that got cleared. So as I was looking through like the monthlies, there was uh, some things that stood out. So that was a little bit of those variances, but uh, overall things are pretty consistent on a month to month basis. I just uh, want to chime in and uh, mention that um, thanks to the staff, Katrina and Desi and um, Alex is now on board and we're just really hitting it hard. We've had some properties that have sold that had liens on them, but we're just daily trying to, um, working hard on collecting old balances. So thanks to the staff for their hard work on that. Yes, I did not mean to uh, discount Katrina and Alex's work there, I apologize. Uh, and then to the operating expenditures, uh, a big portion of that is the salary and benefits. And uh, so those were quite a bit under and so, uh, as I'd mentioned in the public works, uh, when that was so much over, we had thought that some of this was going to get allocated later on and it was ended up still being a little bit under. So we're hopefully going to be a little bit closer on that in 2022. Uh, and then there was some budgeting for a capital expenditure and about half of it got billed last year and, uh, the rest is going to be paid this year. And that is the end of the stormwater utility and the end of my presentation. So any other uh, questions, comments, things you want to see in future presentations, things you never want to see again, uh, let me know. <laughs> Thank you, Riley. Oh, Riley. <laughs> You're fresh of breath there, that's for sure. <laughs> hey, Riley. <clears throat> uh, thank you for that report. It was great. I just had a question. Um, as far as like... Uh, the services, I mean, they're all over the place for different services, but um, specifically, um, would it be possible for you to provide like an itemized list of services for independent contractors? To, so a list of the independent contractors that we have or a breakdown of our budget, what, do you, uh, what exactly are you going for there? Um, just a breakdown of their salaries and what we paid them over 2021. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. So, uh, services paid 2021 to independent contractors can do. And that doesn't necessarily need to be provided tonight. I mean, that's something you could email to us. Oh yeah. I was going to say it's 846. I am not running any reports after this meeting. No problem. I will get that to you. Anyone else? Um, actually, I guess this is more along for the lines of the mayor at that point with this. Um, is there a chance, because I know you guys are going to get ready to start your budget cycle here within probably the next 60 days or something along those lines. Is there a chance that we can go back to where it was broken down um, like it was uh, the first year that I was on the council, I think it was 2018, to where you can actually see where the expenses are going instead of a subject line? So you, are you asking for a more... <clears throat> excuse me, a more detailed budget? 
Yeah, yeah, because well, in 2018, when you and I had spoke and, and went through it, we could actually sit down and go line by line and see everything and where it was going. Uh, in the last few years, we've moved to this new style. I, I don't know if it's new or not. I'm not an accountant, but uh, to me, it's new, uh, where it's all more subject lines, like services and salaries and, and such, instead of the, the breakdown so that we can actually see where the money's uh, being spent at. So yeah, absolutely. When we go through the budget process, we will have a more detailed budget. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice, but <clears throat> but um, I think what you're asking for is we go through the budget process next year to have them, or this year for 2023 to have a more of a detail. Yes, please. Yeah, no, that's that'll be part of the budget as it was last year and the year before. Um, we don't usually just give the summaries when we're going through the, the for the through the budget process. So we will make sure we include that. Okay. Any other questions for Riley? Okay, great report, Riley. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Appreciate your input. So next on the agenda is the executive session. Uh, the executive session will be regarding pending litigation with our city attorney. Um, the executive session should last for about 15 minutes and there will be no action taken after the executive session. So again, council, we'll have to leave this meeting. We'll go to our new, our other, well, it looks like everybody's already headed that way. So I will see you at the next uh, action.
<clears throat> All right. Okay, it's now 9.13. We're coming out of executive session and back to the city council meeting. Uh, again, there will be no action taken as a result of our executive session this evening. Uh, so the last item on the agenda this evening is for adjournment. And if I could please get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Can you not hear me? Can, can you hear me? Yeah, council members, you're gonna have to I, unmute yourselves. Well, I, I would like to uh, discuss something on new business or unfinished, I guess, new business, if that's possible. Uh, I don't see why we can't do that. Um, I wanted to bring up, a, it's kind of something that was touched on then, uh, comments that were at the beginning and then uh, uh, through the police reports and such. Um, waiting two more weeks just to set up a, a meeting for a work session to find out, uh, you know, when we're going to actually have it puts us down another two weeks plus so that, you know, you're looking three weeks, uh, probably minimum. I, I think that we need to have some sort of resolution or maybe not even resolution, but at least uh, an idea moving forward um, for the sake of the city and the sake of the officers that are actually employed now on a direction that we would really like to move. Um, for some of us in our conversation uh, before in our meetings, we talked about even um, hiring police and, and rebuilding the police force, whether that be slow or fast, depending on what the returns look like as far as interest and such uh, due to recruiting, um, while at the same time having some sort of protection or help from either the, the tribe or Woodland at that point. Uh, so I, I would really like to find out if the rest of the council members are um, at least interested or in agreement that we uh, give some direction on maybe starting the recruiting process for police officers in the city of the well, center. Council member, that's not on the agenda. So I think that goes beyond uh, just new business. We would want to have that as an agenda item. Um, so help me out here, Bronson. Does that go beyond what we could discuss under um, new business? Being that we have not noticed that. So as I heard, Council Member Strobin was. Uh, comment was asking more towards not a decision but a timing of when a matter could be discussed and so if it's just to talk about scheduling uh, a time for a discussion of an issue I think that's appropriate but if it's if I'm wrong if it's asking for a decision on an action that should be something that's needed on the agenda okay Okay, understood there, Bronson. Um, yeah, and I, I'm in agreement with that. Can we uh, uh, at least set a meeting tonight so this way we're not another two weeks out before we set a meeting? Do you have a date that you'd like to propose to the city council members? Is this something that this work session uh, or such, um, is this something that needs four or five hours? Is this something that can be done in a couple hours? Because I know you guys were talking about, you know, presenting stuff and, and such. So kind of depends on the time frame, right? If you're talking about four or six hours, then you're probably going to have to split that up into two work sessions. So Saturdays are definitely out of the question for having a some kind of a work session so we could have a four-hour meeting. Council, that's a question to the council. You have to unmute yourselves. I'm available for Saturdays or weekdays. I'd prefer work weekdays. You would prefer what? Weekdays. Okay. I can only do, if people want weekdays, I can only do Wednesdays uh, starting at 630, but I'm always 
I can I can do Saturdays. And our Saturdays for us that have kids in coaching are really ate up uh, with something along the lines of the 30th, uh, like next Wednesday night work for everyone. I don't know that the staff could be ready by next by next Wednesday. Um, our next city council meeting is scheduled for um, April 13th. So how about um, Wednesday? Well, that's my town hall on April, uh, Wednesday the 6th. Um, How do you guys feel about Fridays? I thought you could Fridays meet on Wednesdays. Sorry, sorry, Fridays. Fridays I can as well. I'm sorry. I can meet, I can meet generally starting at 5 o'clock on Friday. Fridays work for me as well. This Friday in particular will not work for me. Well, we couldn't be ready by this Friday. It's going to take staff some time to put this together. Mayor, this is Maria. And I would be happy to send out a doodle poll and put some dates in it if you would like. Okay, well, we can try that again. It hasn't been very successful. Yeah, I really well, just can't people to respond. Okay. Well, and we can't forget about spring break. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to say they're going to be available during the 4th through the 8th, which is spring break. Right. And then we'll have to send a doodle poll to the city staff, too, to make sure that the presenters would be available as well. Okay. Casey, well, that's Casey do you have any issues with Friday? With Fridays? Yeah. Wednesdays and Fridays are good Do you good have issues me? with Fridays? Wednesdays and Fridays are good for you, too. Uh, Sean, besides this Friday, which you've already heard, are they good for you? Yeah, I can make that work. Uh, and Liz? Depends on which Friday. Okay. Well, sounds like we've got some days picked out. I just have to get the date. Maybe we can plan something for the 15th. That's Good Friday. Oh. And I don't know that staff will be um, available on that day, but we'll check. I'm well, not. Council Member Strobin, if we do the doodle poll, would you be acceptable to that? Oh, of course. Okay, well, let's get that way we can get the staff to give us their availability as well. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on this? Okay. Getting back to adjournment. Move to adjourn. Second. Been moved and seconded to adjourn the meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Council. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the evening. Thanks, everyone.